Continuing on with Chapter 30, we're taking a look at the United States' involvement in World War I from 1917 to 1918. Now, another major focus that the United States government has to um, stay focused on, obviously, is how to have enough food for the war effort, to have enough food to send over to the troops or the doughboys over in Europe. Um, we don't feel the direct effect right here in America because the war is going on over on the other side of the Atlantic. So uh, the government created the Food Administration to be headed up by future President Herbert Hoover. Uh, Herbert Hoover um, is a devout conservative, and he said there's no need for the U.S. government to require people give certain things up like we see with rationing in World War II. Instead, he focused on voluntary compliance and donations uh, by the U.S. people. Um, using propaganda to get Americans to voluntarily cut back on their food uh, to help the troops. This is called hooverizing, using that propaganda. So things like Wheatless Wednesdays, Meatless Tuesdays, uh, and promoting people to grow victory gardens because it's the right thing to do. Um, so through this voluntary cooperation, uh, uh, we were able to triple our exports to the doughboys overseas because people were voluntarily giving uh, these things up for the war effort. We also see uh, uh, the 18th Amendment passed at this time as well in 1919, uh, creating prohibition, which we're going to talk about in the next chapter more in depth. But this does occur uh, right at the end of World War I. Um, and so through all of these efforts, especially through the use of propaganda with the um, uh, Food Administration and then obviously the Creel Committee, uh, we see $21 billion raised on the part of the U.S. government to uh, support this war through the Liberty Loan Drives. These are the war bonds. Uh, so as a result, they didn't have to raise taxes as much as they would have had people not chosen to buy these uh, important war, war bonds. And so in comes the war effort. Mobilization means to get ready for war. So building up your army, building up your weaponry in order to fight this war. So at least in the very, very beginning, the original vision was to use the U.S. Navy to maintain uh, the, the seas, to maintain the Allied supply lines. But very early on, almost immediately after the U.S. entered in this war, we realized that that wasn't going to be enough. That if the Allies were going to succeed in Europe, they needed American troops because they've been fighting this war since 1914. Uh, and so in order to maintain the Western Front uh, in France and to keep Germany from capturing Paris, which was their end goal, uh, we needed to have manpower on the ground, especially since we're a new uh, force coming in uh, and we're not beleaguered by these long years of war like the Europeans have at this time. So Congress passed a conscription bill, or a draft, requiring 18 to 45-year-olds to register for the draft. And in this case, uh, it was not legal to hire a sub to replace you like we saw during the Civil War with the $300 men. But some industries were exempted from having to register for the draft because they were so important. Things like shipbuilding were exempted. Um, and there aren't really that many riots uh, during this time as a result, but we do see people dodging the draft, uh, fleeing the country so they don't have to be drafted into the U.S. military. And 4,000 men who registered as conscientious objectors. A conscientious objector is somebody who, for religious reasons or moral reasons, can't fight on the front lines because it is against their religious beliefs. So the U.S. government, in order to allow these people to maintain their freedom of religion, allowed these men to register for the draft as a conscientious objector, promising they won't have to serve on the front line. They could serve in another capacity, working in an office somewhere, um, doing something like that, still supporting the war effort, but not as a soldier on the front line. Um, so... Within four months, we do create about a four million person army, uh, women participating uh, uh, mainly as uh, nurses and whatnot on the front line, and then also African Americans serving in segregated units. The U.S. military does not um, get desegregated until the Korean War, which we'll talk about later. But because it is so important to get these men over to Europe, uh, the doughboys, as the soldiers were known during World War Time, World War One, were not properly trained. It was so important to get them over there that they did not receive the proper training that they probably should have had in order to uh, properly fight this war in Europe. 
Now, when we think about the U.S. military in any sort of a war capacity, we tend to think that the U.S. is always going to overwhelm our enemy with our military prowess. This isn't necessarily the case in World War I. We barely were in Europe for World War I before the war came to an end. Why we were important for the war effort is we are like that shot of adrenaline in the arm. The Allies have been fighting since 1914. They're done. They can barely go on another day. Same with the Central Powers. It's just this threat of the Americans coming over and adding more military power to the beleaguered forces that causes the end of the war to come. So as the German army tries to move towards Paris, uh, a new um, uh, supreme allied commander is named, uh, who is a French field marshal, Ferdinand Foch is named, to command all allied forces in Europe. Um, prior to this, we hadn't had a unifying fighting force. It was just sporadic uh, um, countries here and there. But th this guy is there to oversee all operations in Europe. And by May of 1918, American soldiers start to arrive in um, uh, France to reinforce our allies, when the Germans are only about 40 miles from uh, Paris. So in the first battle ever that Americans fought on European soil, uh, 30,000 American troops sent to the Battle of Chateau Thierry. And this is the first time Americans have fought in a foreign war on European soil. Uh, and this is orchestrated, obviously, like I said, by the Supreme Allied Commander Ferdinand Foch. Uh, by July of 1918, uh, Foch is uh, orchestrating the Second Battle of the Marne using uh, fresh American reinforcements, trying to push the Germans back. Uh, the American forces in this war are being led by General John Pershing, who um, obviously made a name for himself chasing Pancho Villa all over Mexico prior to World War I. So using the American troops under John Pershing, uh, uh, the Allies launched a counterattack to start pushing the Germans back. Um, and this marks the end, or I'm sorry, the withdrawal of the German forces. So much so that by... Um, uh, September to November of 1918, we see the last major offensive with the Battle of Musée Argonne, or the Battle of the Argonne Forest, once again, using American and French and British troops to push the Germans back. Uh, we see with this a success from the Americans because we were able to cut the, rail, the German railroad lines and their supply lines, meaning they're done. They don't want to fight anymore. And even though our troops are very poorly trained, that is just one little shot of adrenaline to end this war of attrition. Both sides are completely starved out. This war has completely destroyed uh, the face of Europe. The thought of having to fight another day against fresh forces is too much for the Central Powers. And so, on the 11th day, at the 11th month, at the 11th hour, November 11th, 1918, at 11 a.m., an armistice was called. The Kaiser abdicated, meaning he stepped down from uh, control in Germany, and the war officially came to an end. Now, we tend to think of, like I said, this powerful American force overwhelming them. That's not really the case. In fact, we participated in very few of the European battles um, during World War I. Really what we provided uh, for World War I is namely uh, material, uh, material uh, for the war effort. We provided food, we provided oil, and some um, of the manpower, but enough to push the Central Powers to want to call for an armistice. And so, with the end of World War I, we have an armistice, but we need to have a peace agreement signed. And so, the Big Four, as they were known, headed to the Paris Peace Conference to come up with a uh, treaty to end World War I. This becomes known as the Treaty of Versailles. Versailles is right outside of Paris. So the big four uh, at the Paris Peace Conference, Woodrow Wilson for the United States, the first time ever a, United States, a sitting United States president has gone to negotiate a peace on his own, uh, the Premier of Italy, Vittorio Orlando, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, David Lloyd George, and the Premier of France, uh, Georges Clemenceau, all met in Paris to um, 
um, come up with this peace agreement. And really one of the main things that they were worried about was the threat of communism coming in, especially since their old ally, the Russian Tsar, had fallen to a communist takeover. So that is a real threat that is going to continue on into the 1920s with the Red Scare. But when they get to the Paris Peace Agreement, um, Woodrow Wilson is focusing on creating a just peace. He wanted to focus on the 14 points as a way to create a just peace. He called for a peace without victory. He didn't want to punish the central powers for their participation in World War I. Really, he wanted to create a just peace so that we could move on beyond this. Uh, the problem is, though, is that the United States came into this war very late. And the other ally said, you have not lost the same level of man men that we've lost. An entire generation of European men are dead from this war. We want to see results. We want to punish them for what they have done to us. Um, so even though a lot of the 14 points didn't happen like Wilson had wanted, the one thing he was unwilling to compromise on was the creation of an international peacekeeping organization. He wanted to create the League of Nations to set up collective security. Let's make war obsolete. He called this the war to end all wars because hopefully we would never need to have a war again. So if a country decided uh, to go to war next time, instead of uh, sending troops into their neighboring country, instead why not take your case to the League of Nations, specifically the World Court, to uh, have this case heard before the rest of the world community. They come to an agreement and we never need to have a war again. So to Woodrow Wilson, the League of Nations was uh, a, a way to solve all of our problems. But remember, one of the main things that Woodrow Wilson was all about was the right of the people to have self-determination, to choose their own government. Um, how can we continue on with imperialism, and what are we going to do with the colonies of the former um, uh, Central Powers countries? Shouldn't they have the right to choose their own government? However, he was overruled with it, this idea to allow them to just have their own uh, government right off the bat. Um, France and Great Britain primarily said they're not ready for self-government yet. These former colonies of uh, the Ottoman Empire and Germany and the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. So let's make them mandates of the League of Nations, meaning that the League of Nations would oversee them until such a time as they could uh, gain their independence. So this is how it, the country of Iraq, for example, uh, became under the purview of Great Britain. Great Britain administered to Iraq uh, as a result of the League of Nations mandate. Same with Syria. Syria was controlled by France after World War I because they were overseeing that mandate for the League of Nations. So the way the League of Nations was set up, it's very Congress-like. Uh, an assembly was created where every nation of the world had one vote for all the countries there. There was also a council uh, that had overseeing powers. They had the right to veto. Um, and this would have been headed up by all of the allies from World War I and then other countries on a rotating basis. This is very similar to what the UN is like today. And finally, a world court that would uh, be a separate entity to hear international law disputes and problems with between other countries. And then almost as like a secretary type organization, the secretariat to do the paperwork and keep everything running smoothly. So the creation of a, uh, a, a new international peacekeeping organization, the League of Nations, for the first time focusing on the creation of international law. And here you see the big four at the Paris Peace Conference. The problem is that Woodrow Wilson had to get the Treaty of Versailles past the Senate back at home. Um, he can't just go to Europe, make an agreement, and come home and everything's fine. There are several people within the U.S. Senate, or several different factions within the U.S. Senate, who don't really like the Treaty of Versailles as the way Woodrow Wilson had set it up. Uh, irreconcilables, as they were known. These are people, mostly isolationists, who said, there's no way. We don't want anything to do with the League of Nations. We just got dragged into a Europe. European war for no reason. They felt that the League of Nations was a violation of their sovereignty as a uh, individual country. So entering into a League of Nations uh, would violate the Monroe Doctrine. It would violate the U.S. Constitution. The specific passage in uh, the League of Nations Charter that they disliked was Article 10. Article 10 would have required the U.S. government to supply military troops uh, in future events if the League of Nations called on them. 
the senators, rightfully so, said, this violates our right to declare war and send troops where we want to. And so they focused more on isolationism. So within this group, we have strict isolationists, but we also have people who would be considered reservationists, who had some reservations. Sure, we can join the League of Nations, but let's change a couple things, specifically that Article 10 that they were leery about. But Woodrow Wilson has already done a lot of compromising. He's already thrown 90% of the 14 points out the window in order to get this Treaty of Versailles off the ground with the other allies. Now he's going to come home and have to deal with uh, the senators who dislike what had been done. So he was kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place because he can't make changes without the agreement of the other allies. Uh, and especially since the other allies are not looking to create a uh, peace without victory. They wanted to ensure that Germany could never rise up again um, and create the uh, problems that were created with World War I. They were also looking for land acquisition in order uh, to make it all worthwhile. For example, France is looking to take control of the Saar Valley. This had been uh, German land that had a lot of coal in it. Um, uh, also with the Rhineland as well. This had been German territory prior to this, but France wants it for themselves. Um, Japan, who had entered this war just for territorial gain, wanted to take control of some of the German colonies, namely the Shandong Valley and uh, some of the German islands out in the Pacific. But once again, this is violating the tenets of the 14 points. But nonetheless, Wilson can't do everything. And so in uh, uh, 1919, we signed the Security Treaty. Uh, the U.S. and Great Britain promised assistance to France if Germany should ever attack again. Remember, France shares a border with Germany. They're very fearful of a future war coming, uh, which obviously does happen, and we ignored that security treaty. Uh, here you see the debate going on in uh, the Senate as uh, the League of Nations and the Treaty of Versailles that it's obviously linked to were continuously discussed. Now, Germany, who had surrendered... Uh, during World War I felt duped. They felt that they had been taken for a ride because the Treaty of Versailles did not follow the 14 points. And this is going to be a rallying cry for Hitler later on. In fact, World War II really shouldn't be called World War II. It should be World War I Part II. But no matter what, even though Germany is getting the raw end of the deal, Wilson felt, you know what, it doesn't matter. The League of Nations will fix any inequalities that are created with this uh, treaty. But like I said, the reservationists are worried about some of the major things with joining the uh, League of Nations, namely Article 10 that would have required the U.S. government to send troops should the League of Nations have called on it. So Wilson is done compromising. He says, I'm not putting any more reservations through. I'm not making any modifications to this. Vote on it this way or don't vote on it at all. And in fact, he urged his fellow Democrats to vote down the treaty because he didn't want the treaty being passed with the amendments that the reservationists were trying to push through. And so as a result of this, because the reservationists were trying to push through these changes, uh, the isolationists were saying no, and now the Democrats were saying no, the Treaty of Versailles was voted down because of this problem. The public was absolutely shocked. It was voted on a second time. Once again, they were unable to get this treaty passed in the U.S. Senate. Um, here you see a uh, uh, political cartoon of the day, Uncle Sam leaning on this bridge that is the League of Nations. And obviously the major gap in this is the United States. We never joined the League of Nations, this, uh, this uh, international organization that Woodrow Wilson created. So in 1920... Woodrow Wilson is obviously done, but he wanted to use the election of 1920 almost as a referendum on the Treaty of Versailles. He wanted the American people to vote for the Democratic candidate um, to say that, see, the American people do want to have the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations that goes with it. The Republicans nominated Warren G. Harding from Ohio with Calvin Coolidge as his vice president. They are both very conservative.
their platform was very, very ambiguous. They didn't really lean one way or another. Um, but all they kept talking about was they wanted a return to normalcy, as they said. Uh, they tried to create this image of plain spoken type people sitting on their front porch uh, drinking lemonade like a regular person to contrast, obviously, to the very um, high up uh, intelligent, well, uh, uh, high-educated Woodrow Wilson. He is more folksy compared to Woodrow Wilson. The return to normalcy is really going to mean a return to conservatism, a return to isolationism, a return to nativism, and a movement away from progressivism. We're about to enter a new era, moving away from progressivism now towards conservatism. The Democrats nominated Ohio Governor James Cox and FDR as his VP candidate. They were strong supporters of the League of Nations. But in the end, Warren G. Harding won with a majority of the electoral votes. And this is going to mean the death for the League of Nations. The United States never joined the League of Nations. And as a result, it's like taking them out at the kneecaps before they can even start. Uh, here you see the electoral map of 1920. And so World War I really set in motion what is going to happen with World War II. The U.S. didn't join the League of Nations. This seriously crippled them from the beginning to leave out such an important country in the League of Nations. Uh, the Senate never ratified uh, that security treaty because we didn't want to deal with Europe anymore. And as a result, France started rearming. Um, also, the European countries had demanded massive amounts of money for reparations from Germany, from Austro-Hungary. They don't have this money. This is going to help lead to the creation of an international depression. And because Germany was so humiliated at the end of World War I, and land had been taken from them, and ethnic Germans now found themselves under uh, the ownership of um, France or under Poland or under Czechoslovakia, this is going to be a rallying cry for Adolf Hitler, who is coming, saying, you know what, we're going to take back all of this land that was taken from us in that humiliating Treaty of Versailles. And that is Chapter 30.